Right at the refrain, yes. I was expecting Dr. Ortiz to uh, launch into the chorus. Yeah, oh well. Okay, so we are back for our final discussion panel of the day, and this one is a roundtable, a uh, roundtable discussion that is hosted by Jennifer Berkshire. Uh, Jennifer is the block lecturer in education journalism, lecturer in education studies at Yale University. Um, and she's the creator of the influential educational podcast, um, Have You Heard? So every time that I reached out um, with suggestions on people who should be involved in this topic in particular, uh, your name came up. And I'm like, okay, great, we have her. So Jennifer, please. Thank you so much. So thank thank you. So we have um, we have an amazing and obviously quite substantial panel for today's uh, final event, and we have been given the exciting but also somewhat challenging task of of kind of summing up in some ways some of the themes that have come up over the past couple of days. And we're going to be influencing, uh, we're going to be focusing on, I think, two words in the title of the, conf uh, the conference, and those would be both confronting and contested. Because one of the themes that has come up again and again since, uh, since we started yesterday is just how much resistance there is to a lot of the terrible policy stuff that's coming down. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me. And then what I'm going to do is introduce the folks on the stage and, and ask them to give us a sense of where they are, what, what they're seeing in the part of the world where they are. So when I arrived at the conference yesterday, it was at the tail end of the journalist panel. And it just happened that somebody in the audience had asked, you know, why, why is so much of the coverage so bad. And I'm sitting in my little seat back there nodding away because my I think of my beat as chronicling the resistance or what I call the backlash to the backlash. And I feel very strongly that we have been uh, treated pretty poorly by our journalists that this late in the game, we are still being told stories about Moms for Liberty as though their power was increasing and not that candidates who run on, on extreme issues and parents' rights lose 70% of the time. Um, we rarely hear that uh, 50 miles away from us in Jacksonville, Florida's largest city, uh, the they have a new Democratic mayor who shocked the Republican establishment. And one of the reasons was that the the candidate she ran against allied himself with Moms for Liberty and moderate Republicans were turned off by that idea and came out to vote against him. And uh, and now here we are uh, two years after Glenn Youngkin won that victory in Virginia, and we are still reading the same stories about the potency of parents' rights as a political issue when, um, as I have typed again and again, you cannot find a single candidate in the country who has attracted Democratic votes by running on that that platform. So what we're going to be doing today is really we've, we've put our heads together and we've been thinking about the, the various ways that that people can can strategize to defend things like the freedom to teach. And Paul Ortiz, I want to start with you because you are a uh, I think of you as a people's historian. You're at the University of Florida. You're also the head of the faculty union there. And one of the things that I love about Paul Ortiz, those of you in Florida are probably familiar with him, but he gives the greatest quotes in the world. And I actually have one handy. No, this is not weird at all that I would just happen to have a Paul Ortiz quote ready right here. So Paul did an interview um, recently, and, and he made this point that faculty at, at Florida colleges and universities have gotten good pretty quickly at fighting 
back with their backs against the walls. And so he's doing an interview and he says to the person interviewing him, there's a reason the state of Florida is trying to ban the idea of intersectionality. They want us to feel like we're isolated and powerless. They don't want us to join unions. They want to rule and control and they feel that this is their time. That, sir, is a quote. I, mean, I, I, I said, if you said it, that's it. <laughs> so just so give us an example of of what that looks like to be fighting with your backs against the wall. Well, I think it goes back to um, in, in the first day when a few colleagues mentioned Richard Spencer, uh, when I was a Nazi. And the other faculty of Florida, my from really great UFF colleagues. On the main CF of the chapters this weekend, um, arguing, and this was back in 2016 or 2017, and this was even before the COVID pandemic, um, arguing in, um, engaged in an intersectional coalition with the community, with different people on campus, people from all different political walks of life, different religious backgrounds. And we show Richard Spencer down, we retired Richard Spencer. I um, remember this was after Charlottesville, and so what we did before he came to campus was we did a series of teachings, uh, we engaged heavily with our Jewish studies faculty, with the LGBT students, uh, Black Lives Matter Coalition, and we did a number of different teachings and preparing to protest, and let the Richard Spencer people know. See, at one point, the Richard Spencer people were going to bring 5,000 people to Gainesville, Florida, we were in march with their tiki torches throughout our, our, our city, and we let them know in advance, we're coming to the real south, and then he didn't even wear those carry guns. So instead of 5,000 people, he had maybe 100 people. I would still call some ruckus. But you know, a week after he came to Gainesville, he came out and said, you know, I'm, I'm stopping the college uh, speaking circuit. It's, it's not fun anymore. And that was just simple coalition building. And I mean, so, and Susan Hayden and I wrote a piece in um, the Higher Education Journal about that. If folks want to read about how we put that coalition together. But I think, in some ways, the, the coalition against Richard Spencer, the neo Nazi who tried to really attack our community, um, was a prelude to, to what would happen later. That's such a great example. And we will we'll come back to what happened later. And we're going to stay in Florida from now. We're going to go up. Uh, we're going to go up the coast. We're going to uh, we're headed to Tallahassee and it's home to Reggie Ellis, who is an assistant professor, associate professor of history and assistant dean of. No more. Oh, oh, good thing that uh, good thing that I I blanked on that. So um, so uh, so Reggie, you have written really written and spoken really powerfully um about the what the discovery of of learning about African American history meant for your own life. And listening to the panels over the last couple of days, one thing that has jumped out to me again and again is that if the goal of these policies has been to steer people away from African American history and African American studies they are backfiring spectacularly and i wondered i want to i want to hear about how the world looks from your vantage point at at florida a m uh well thank you for that question i think that back in january when you know everything kind of came to florida as it relates to the governor uh saying that the, the ap african-american studies course wouldn't be taught i was actually at the uh, florida humanities council board meeting um, and I got a call from my communications uh, director saying, hey, MSNBC wants to interview you about, about this case. And the first thought was, I don't need to do it because I'm going to get in trouble. But then I thought about, I had just left uh, the AHJ and we, we were having some private discussions. And one of the things that struck me is that my discipline uh, had my back. And in this moment, I needed to have my disciplines back. So I had I stopped thinking about um, what would happen to me. <laughs> I, well, I had to stop thinking about what would potentially happen to me because I understood that my university, being the only uh, state-supported historically black college in in, uh, in 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 the state of Florida, and being virtually only about two and three two or three miles away from the capital, and also understanding that the governor would be watching and paying attention to everything we said, I also understood that. Again, 
I was going to be speaking for my colleague, Dr. Young, who no one at the time knew that he was actually on the committee. Uh, so I, I was speaking for him. I was speaking for uh, Professor Canton. I was speaking for all of these individuals that I knew in the field. And I was speaking for the students that would be deprived this curriculum because of from my assessment of political agenda. And so uh, I left uh, Tampa, drove four and a half hours back to Tallahassee, scrambled to get my stuff ready, get get my Zoom, my, my Zoom world ready, and to be prepared to, to discuss to the world the importance of that curriculum. And, and so what we have heard throughout this particular co uh, conference is really the importance as a scholar in this field is that we cannot be uh, we cannot cower to the moment right we it's our job the trained the trained historians to not allow someone else to control the narrative i remember uh, and i'll close on this point when i first uh, got involved with the aha years ago it was the tuning project and one of the things that jim grossman said at the time was we have allowed other individuals to define the field of history. And so that's our fault. And in that moment, in this moment, what I've heard several times, Dr. McLean, uh, Dr. Blight, uh, Mike, uh, we all have said we have to regain control of the narrative as historians and to define what it is that we are actually doing. And I think leaving this conference, uh, I'm, in the words of Barack Obama, I'm fired up and ready to go. Thank you for that. And um, Reggie sent me uh, some notes that he had taken. And number one was do not cower. And I think we we that's that's the spirit with which we're approaching this. Julian, I want to I want to skip down to you. Julian Vasquez Heilig is a new provost at Western Michigan University. And one of the things that makes him really interesting is I think we've all picked up on the fact that there is this divide between higher ed and K-12 that 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 there are there aren't that many of us who really have a foot in both worlds. And Julian is one of them. In addition, in addition to his academic work, he is a longtime board member of the Network for Public Education, which is really the national group that's leading the fight back against not just things like, like censorship, but, but also school privatization. So talk to us a little bit about what the, the world looks like through your eyes. Of course. So, so glad to be here with you today. I have to give you the uh, preface that uh, anything I say here today represents my scholarly activities and not necessarily my administrative role. Um, so I was uh, reading a piece maybe two weeks ago, talked about Chris Rufo. How many of you have heard of, of Chris Rufo? Oh, a lot of you. That's great. Now, as you read through, he, he recently gave a talk at Hillsdale College, which is just up the road from where I'm at in, in Western Michigan. And he has been one of the architects of, of a lot of this um, Stop Woke Act, um, uh, the CR attacks on critical race theory. Um, and essentially what he said in his um, talk at Hillsdale College, of course, Hillsdale College is the place where these um, humanities critical uh, uh, thinking test, uh, help me here. All, all of those things um, are, are being supported by the Hillsdale curriculum. Classical. Classical thinking, yes, thank you very much. Um, and he essentially said one thing that sums up what, what's happening right now. We must siege the institution. So you think about Lord of the Rings, okay, and, and you got the castle on the hill, and you have um, all the orcs out there, and they've got catapults, and they've got, um, you know, all the things. They're guys on elephants. This is what's going on. This is a very organized activity. Now, for a long time, K-12 was primarily the aim of, of these folks, whether it be privatization of those schools through charter schools or vouchers, control of the curriculum. We had a, um, an educator from Texas talking about how they spent two weeks on the standards for them to just throw it all out the window. But then you have DeSantis here saying, oh, but it's scholars and teachers that put these standards together. But once they get their fingers on them, that's when you get these sort of onerous uh, and problematic statements, right? And so this is a very coordinated structural attack on structures 
and institutions. And for a long time, higher ed, we kind of were able to avoid it. It was just K-12 and it was continually K-12, but they brought back the CRT wars, right? I, we wrote a piece in um, uh, the Harvard Education Review 10 years ago using CRT as a lens for Black studies and Latinx studies, et cetera, because that was the last time we were talking about slavery being called Atlantic Triangular Trade now. Now, some of the worst things can, ended up coming out of the Texas standards, but this is something that they come back to every decade. But now it is a siege not only on K-12, it's a siege also on higher ed. Now, I have a story from right here in Florida. Um, you know, I was an education dean before I became a provost, and um, I had one of my faculty come to me and say, uh, one of the education deans here in Florida called a faculty member from the teacher ed program into his office and said, you're teaching too much about diversity in your education uh, courses for uh, future educators. Because a lot of what this is is about the chilling effect, right? Because the Stop Woke Act ultimately probably is unconstitutional. I mean, we don't know that for sure, but probably is. And so this is a combined siege, not only on K-12, it's on higher ed. And we have to organize together. And maybe I'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little later. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is a perfect transition to, uh, to the gentleman next to me. Um, Jim Grossman is the head of the American Historical Association. And I picked up this great sticker from you. It says, you don't scare me. I'm a historian. It's a companion to that that we have not yet printed, uh, which is, I'm a historian. I know when to be scared. <laughs> so that's perfect. My um, my uh, podcast co-host and writing collaborator is an education historian. Uh, something, a knowledge base that I've grown to view is incredibly valuable because I'm able to ask him about virtually anything. Have we lived through this before and how did it end? And so I would like you to provide us with a bit of context for what we're seeing right now, because I feel like that's actually one of the contested issues in this conference is how we should, like, it's the job of the historian to always pop up and say, you know, oh, you think it's new. It's not new at all. Uh, it's new. In, is my mic on? Is this one on? Yeah, yeah it's on now. Uh, it's it's new in some ways and not new in other ways. Uh, and I see Nancy nodding her head, which assures me that I'm probably right. Uh, I, I think that the first thing, though, that as a historian, I want to emphasize to everybody here, and then I'll get to your question specifically. Uh, we've been talking about legislation and standards. How many people, and I, I'm not saying this to embarrass people, uh, how many people here have read any of the legislation, the divisive concepts legislation? Wow, that's a lot. I have never spoken anywhere where that many hands have gone up. How many of you have read the 24 pages of African-American standards promulgated by the Florida Department of Education? Okay, so, okay. Uh, what I want to emphasize before I answer that, because I want to emphasize that you can't answer that question unless you have done the reading. I hate to sound like a professor, uh, but the number of things that I have read that in essence misunderstand what's going on. And if you don't get it right, you got a target on your back. So some people have, this goes to what's happened before. So some people have criticized legislatures for sticking their nose into K through 12 education. Legislatures have been sticking their nose into K through 12 education for a very long time, as you well know, and we have not objected. State of California has a very sophisticated LBGTQ plus uh, history uh, mandate in its curriculum. The state of Illinois mandates that you have to teach slavery, the Holocaust, and the Irish potato famine. I think Illinois, New York, it's definitely slavery, the Holocaust and the Irish potato famine. There are these kinds of mandates all over the country. And we have not, none of us have objected to that. So in principle, none of us have objected to states sticking their nose into the content of high school history education. So that's part of the context. But the other part is that what is new is the difference between a mandate and a prohibition. That's what's new. Uh, it's very hard to go back and find prohibitions as opposed to mandates. And one of the important differences there is that prohibitions are censorship. To say a teacher cannot teach X, Y, or Z. Uh, you can go back to World War I. 
uh, teaching of German was prohibited in many states. Uh, there was, as we all know, because we watched the movie, uh, we all know about uh, evolution in the 1920s, but that actually, the prohibition of teaching evolution was not as widespread uh, as is popularly thought. There was very little during the Cold War. Nancy would know some of this better than I do, I think. Uh, there's very little during the Cold War of prohibition about teaching about anything communist, Marxist, whatever. Instead, there were the kinds of chilling effects that you've talked about, where uh, groups that are very similar to the groups acting now, actually, would send things around to parents saying, if your child's teacher is using the following words, she's a Marxist. Uh, but there was no state prohibition on the use of those words. So that, that is what is new here. Uh, that, and and this, this notion of, of the prohibitions. The other thing that's new here is having organizations that stick a bounty on teachers' heads. We haven't seen a lot of that before. Uh, the, the AHA uh, was one of the few organizations that wrote to the Museum of the American Revolution objecting to them renting space to Moms for Liberty. And it wasn't because Moms for Liberty stands for X, Y, or Z. They have a right to stand for whatever they damn please. But they put a $500 bounty on the heads of teachers in New Hampshire uh, for any parent who reported a teacher for violating the state's divisive concepts law. That's crossing the line. So that kind of thing is new. So what's new here is I think the level of polarization and the context for that is the national level of polarization. I believe this is the last Congress, was it? Was the first Congress where the furthest left Republican uh, was to the right of the furthest right Democrat. Digest that for a second. That's an incredible level of partisan polarization. And so that's part of, so you have two contexts here. You have the historical context and you have that political context of polarization. Thank you, that, that was terrific. And I also really appreciate, I know how hard it can be for historians to really, to keep things pithy. And I thought you did admirably. I try. <laughs> so uh, we've saved the best for last. Christine Marsh joins us from Arizona. I had the privilege of interviewing her a few years ago when she was running to be a state senator in Arizona. I knew she was going to win and she did. She's also a former Arizona State Teacher of the Year. And Christine, I was interviewing a Florida public education activist a few days ago and I asked her, what gives you hope right now? And she said, actually, Arizona. And I said, really? What? why Arizona? And she said, it's a perfect example of how when people realize how bad things it can get, that's when you really see the organization, the organizing start to take off. Give us a sense for people in the audience, both here and watching on the live stream, what, what's going on in Arizona? Uh, thank you. I'm really honored to be here today. I, I think you know, from my vantage point, it is uh, what everything has happened this weekend and everything that we've heard is happening in Arizona as well. It is incredibly divisive. Uh, the teachers are absolutely under attack and it has been kind of the snowball, to use a tired old metaphor, the snowball going down the hill and gaining speed and gaining um, size for a number of years. Uh, and yet it is a hopeful place. I, I, it is. Um, you know, I'm also a teacher. And I was saying earlier that, you know, the kids I, I teach for, I teach in the morning, kind of, I joke around, but I'm really not joking. I teach in the morning and get my soul filled by 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, uh, and then head down to the Capitol, and my soul is emptied out again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this divisiveness from my experience, I know it happens, but from my experience, this divisiveness is not hitting into the kid world, which I think is absolutely fabulous. But, yeah, we have gotten um, a lot of people really active, and that's what it's going to take. Um, for us, it is right now holding the line in the legislature, um, 
it's defense. We are, you know, we're not quarterbacks. We're the linebackers. We're the defense because we are the minority party. But, you know, one thing that I absolutely highly recommend is teachers getting out there and running for office where it makes sense. It doesn't always make sense, right? Like we have, and I'm not going to even mention names because who knows who's watching this and who knows what plan they're going to discover that we have. But there are like, for example, certain school board races in Arizona that we do not want anybody else running because it dilutes the vote. And if there's two seats, you want two good candidates. You do not want three or four good candidates because it dilutes the vote. Um, so with that disclaimer said, where it makes sense and working with the political structures overhead, I would love to see teachers running for office, even if you lose. I mean, I lost my first race by 267 votes, which was hard. Um, but then I won the next two. And there's this incredible overlap between the skills that are required to be a good teacher and the skills that are required to be a good legislator, right? In the teaching world, we give every paper that comes before us a fair read, <laughs> despite the fact of what might have been going on yesterday. Maybe, you know, little Johnny who doesn't even want you to like him and is doing everything possible to make sure you don't like him and being disruptive and everything that now you he gets a fair read on his essay. Um, and that is what it takes to be a legislator is looking at the policy, not looking at the sponsor, looking at the policy and evaluating the policy, regardless of who might be sponsoring that particular bill. Um, but we also then, of course, are, you know, teachers have their feet on the ground level and really know what's going on in the communities. Um, so we have um, had a number. We have a teacher's caucus down at the Capitol, um, actually more in the House than in the Senate. But still, we have through the years, more and more teachers have run. What I would encourage, and I've said this actually even to my legislative colleagues in Arizona, that uh if your district and your principal will support doing both, that that is like the ideal world, um, the ideal situation to see what's truly happening in communities and then go down to the Capitol and advocate for what those kids need, because ultimately it always it all comes back to kids. Right. It all comes back to kids. That's that's terrific. Um, so, Paul, I want to come back to you because you're also the you're the head of the faculty union at University of Florida, and unions have turned out to be really important in everything that's going on in Florida. And once again, just like I was joking that if their goal was to steer people away from things like African American studies, it's really backfired. I think you see something similar happening with unions. If you think about those amazing teachers we heard from yesterday, Haley, who I think may still be here, and Brant, you can actually you know like the like people recognize that the unions are absolutely vital right now and that you know that wasn't necessarily the case even a few years ago so talk to us a little bit about the role that unions have been been playing and what you'd like to see them do more of Jennifer I'm glad you asked the question because I mean I as a labor historian this is really the most exciting point in my entire career when I first went to grad school in 1993 to be a labor historian I came up from the labor movement I've been organized with the United Farm Workers and other unions and but when I got to Duke in 1993 and I think Nancy will smile at this um we were told my cohort was told that labor history was dead we were told the American working class was finished. It was all about Bill Gates and the upper class taking control. And obviously, it turns out to not be true. But there's a reason why 71% of Americans now support unions, because they see unions broadly based, broadly speaking, as a counterweight to this reactionary assault. So what we've done at the University of Florida, I'm going to talk about two levels. One, what we've done at UF, but what's happening nationally is that, I'm, I'll, I'll just give two examples. We've talked a lot about black studies, about critical race theory this weekend, and we've talked about gender studies. So 
Many of you remember the day after HB 999 was released in the state of Florida, the first iteration of the bill carried a ban on gender studies in higher education. So because I'm also on a tenure and privilege committee in my, on my university, I got a call right away saying, well, uh, Professor Ortiz, uh, I guess we're going to have to dismantle the gender studies department at UF. And so the tenure, the TMP committee is going to be responsible for finding new homes for our faculty who are going to be leaving gender studies. Well, I was still president of the faculty union then. I'm actually, I've transitioned off, but as president of the faculty union, I'm like, uh-uh, we have a collective bargaining contract and we're going to lose that contract. The university cannot change terms and conditions of employment unless they come to the union to bargain that. So I called our provost office and I said, y'all can't shut down gender studies. And the pro, you know what the pro, you know what they said? Thank God the union called because no one wants to shut down gender studies in the and make us the laughing stock of the entire country. So thank you so much. And so we, we, we call that saving gender studies. But the same thing with the critical race theory. The year before, we had leaders on our campus who went to several junior colleagues in the College of Education. Now, all of you have read about this in Chronicle of Higher Ed, all these stories I'm telling. But it's interesting how the corporate media has downplayed the victories that we have had in Florida. I have questions for them. Um, but the, many of you are familiar with the Chris Busey case. So Basically, UF again was saying, okay, there's no law that says we, we that uh, banning us or prohibiting us from teaching uh, critical race theory yet or about systemic inequality, but we're afraid. And we're going to tell the junior faculty in the College of Ed, don't teach that. Well, we just filed a chapter grievance against that. We said, you can't tell these scholars they can't pursue the things they got their PhDs in and that they have federal grants for. And so, again, the union really sprung into action, Jennifer, to, to defend, in this, in this sense, literally critical race theory and, and also gender studies. Um, I'll also say that at, at UF, and, I, and you've heard of this whole weekend, I mean, we are the people we've been looking for. We're the leaders we've been looking for, right? We're, and in some ways, I feel like we're almost like preaching to the choir. This has been really exciting. But gosh, I wish some of our administrators could be here. I wish our superintendents could be here because it's just it's just so exciting to to be here and to hear these stories of resistance and to understand that um, just about everyone is on our side, Jennifer. That's the the thing I want to kind of close out on is I get calls a lot from very conservative parents who call me to talk about why they are supporting tenure because they want their kids to go to to a school that's stable. It's not chaotic. We know that Governor DeSantis wants chaos. He rules by chaos. The new generation of Republican leaders, Matt Gates, uh, Donald Trump, they, as Nancy can tell us, they rule by shaking things up, right? But if you're a parent, I mean, I, 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 my wife and I have a kid at Portland State University right now. We don't want Portland State University to be shaken up. <laughs> we don't want it to be stable get Josh, get his degree, and let him finish. Don't use him as an experiment in chaos. That's that's just so well put. Let's just stay with the issue of unions just for a second, because we've got somebody from Michigan on the stage where the UAW is currently on strike. And, and some of you probably remember that it was really only, you know, uh, a few years ago that Michigan was a right to work state that Michigan was, was had a Republican trifecta rule. Like a lot of, of you are familiar with now and Michigan is no longer a right to work state because basically the voters weighed in and things look a little bit different there now. And I feel like that issue has sort of, you know, it's hovered over this whole uh, conference that so much of what's happening is dependent on who's occupying the seats in the legislature and what do you do about that? Yeah. And the priorities are different. Let me get to that real quickly, but I want to respond, you know, conservative, politically conservative scholars, they like tenure too. Yeah. And it turns out that the legislature found out that they can't recruit politically conservative scholars to highlight yeah. without tenure. And they said, whoops, maybe this was a bad idea. Um, so yeah, so I was in Kentucky before um, serving as a college of education dean at UK. 
And I think one of the really unfortunate things about Kentucky is that because of the super majorities in the legislature, that the university is afraid of the legislature. I can say that now. I couldn't say that then. They're, they're literally afraid of the legislature. And, um, you know, they would monitor my Twitter, any tweet. I would get a phone call if they didn't like a tweet that I tweeted. So being in Michigan where the, the situation has changed is a breath of fresh air for me. And part of the reason why that changed was because the citizens in that state decided that they'd had enough of gerrymandering. And so what they did was is the citizens now decide the districts. And what that means is that our politics are a little different now. They're not as divided. They're not as caustic. Right. And it means that citizens can have the um, uh, candidates of their choice. And so because of that, for the first time in 40 years, we now have a Democratic governor, a Democratic Senate, excuse me, and a Democratic House because there's no gerrymandering in Michigan. Uh, and it's, it's really changed the politics of that state. And it actually means completely different priorities. Instead of talking about CRT and all the other nonsense that you see in Texas and Florida and these other places, what we're talking about is how do we solve the teacher shortage? How do we give money to districts to grow your own? And now we're going to have 500, let me say that again, 500 new grow your own um, future teachers at Western Michigan this year. We have about 25%. That's what the legislature in Michigan is focused on. They're focused on solutions to things like the teacher shortage instead of talking about CRT and, and curriculum standards and tests that are not reliable and valid related to classical studies. It's a whole nother conversation. Um, we're talking about things that actually make a difference for communities and for schools and for educators and solving real problems. And that's, that's one of the things that's been really exciting about being in that state is that the ideas that are coming out of our capital, we're not shaking our heads. We're thinking like, okay, let's, how, how do we partner? How do we as a community work together to address things like the teacher shortage? And so, yes, it's a breath of fresh air to be in a state where legislators are actually doing things and making progress and it's not chaos. That I mean, I it's just, and it, but it's so important for us to recognize how recent that is. That you know, it was it was only a few years ago that you had Republican legislators basically trying to ban people and state universities from talking about labor issues. Have done is they've funded it's five or six percent to universities of higher education. So you see this in California too. When you have one party in control, they're making investments in higher education. And what does that mean? We can pay our staff better. Eventually we're gonna be able to pay our faculty better when we come to those contracts. This is one of the most difficult parts of my job is being provost. Um, coming from United Mine Worker, coming from uh, United Auto Worker, my grandparents are United Auto Workers, Michigan Nurses Association, I was California Faculty Association. So now being the person on the other side of the table and taking all the heat is has, has been difficult for me. But ultimately we understand that people have families to take care of and we gotta figure out how to do that better. And we are getting more resources to do that um, from the legislature. So uh, Reggie and Jim, I'm going to ask both of you this question and let you sort of fight it out to, to see, see who takes it. So one of the issues that's really hung over the last couple of days is this whole issue of partisanship. Um, I know this is one that I've really had to wrestle with that on the one hand, you know, I'm somebody who wants to win the culture wars. And on the other hand, I understand more and more that our public schools as public institutions require stakeholders from across the political spectrum. And it's something that the two of you are very aware of in your role with various professional associations just walk us through like how do we navigate this that on the one hand we're i think we know where when paul says that we are in the majority that the majority of people agree with us i'm convinced that he's right but i also know that we have to be careful about not appending the color blue or the letter d next to a public institution that is at the center of our democracy it's it's not agree with us or disagree with us i think that's part of the problem is that these are complicated issues and there are things over here that some people are going to say yeah that makes sense that's sensible for example tenure um most people i know who are not academics are totally behind the importance of tenure for academic freedom job security not so much because they say what makes you so special Without our in the what I'm saying is these are complicated issues. It's not people for us or against us. 
What the AHA has been trying to do with our work is to emphasize effectiveness. So we've written to legislators in 20 different states. We write to individual legislators. And we do not write them angry, threatening letters. Uh, I did an op-ed, and we also write op-eds not in the New York Times, but in state newspapers. I had one in the Miami Herald a couple of weeks ago. Uh, when the Ohio legislature was debating divisive concepts legislation, op-ed in the Columbus newspaper with the headline, how to destroy a great university. Conservatives are not in favor of destroying Ohio State University. And if you make the argument that if you get rid of tenure and if you put every, and this is what the bill had said, you put everybody on a one to four year contract and you get rid of tenure, guess what happens? Your scientists can't get NIH grants. So this is the kind of space where there are many people who agree with you. And we do the same sort of thing when we sign on to amicus briefs. And by the way, we do sign on to amicus briefs in the case that was cited uh, yesterday. Actually, we had said to the lawyer, please send us a copy of the brief so we can read it. And the lawyer never sent it. That's why we never signed it. Uh, so you can, if you're careful, one of the things we also do is when we send letters to state legislators, we then send an email to everybody in our database who lives in that state and say, write to your legislator, because that's part of the effectiveness, which is we can speak out, uh, you can speak out in another state. What matters is people in the state speaking out to their legislator. It doesn't matter what we say unless we say things that help people contact their legislator. So yes, that's right. Most people do not wanna destroy their university. Uh, there's a study that's gonna come out. I cannot tell you which is, it's not ours. Uh, there's a study that's gonna come out this fall that's gonna argue that employers are tilting away from hiring people from um, universities whose education is being, um, negatively affected by state legislation. Uh, not surprisingly, employers don't wanna hire people who have not gotten an education that includes critical thinking. Uh, so, and, and we're in the middle right now, then I'll think, we're in the middle right now, we're almost done. Uh, one of the things that the legislation that you're reading about, it starts with a premise and the premise is like a push pull. It outlaws things that we don't even know the teachers are doing. And so all of us are saying, well, they're not teaching CRT, they're not teaching 1619. Quite frankly, actually, we don't know. Nobody knows. And what we've realized from polls, poll after poll, and one of them has been cited, Nancy cited it earlier, uh, people do want teachers to teach good history, good mathematics, good English. What we're doing is we're going to have by, the, by late fall, data on what teachers are actually teaching. Oddly enough, it is in the interest of the right and the left to argue that people are, that high school teachers are using 1619 all over the place and teaching CRT. Our preliminary results say it ain't true. Uh, 1619 is pretty far down the list, actually. Pulitzer and the New York Times want everybody to think that people are using it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The right wing, Christopher <laughs> Rufo wants them to think, wants everybody to think everybody's using it. In point of fact, what teachers are doing on Sunday, someone mentioned earlier, what does a teacher do on Sunday night when on Monday they're teaching something they don't know about? Where do they go? It turns out they go to some pretty straightforward places, uh, real left wing places like Stanford University. Uh, so this is the kind of thing when you say, how do you convince people? Most people want to know facts. Your colleagues in the Arizona legislature, they want to know facts, right? Some. Some, but, but that's the whole point, is the ones who don't, they're over there, we can't worry about them, that's the 15 to 25%. We're not going to convince them of anything. But I assume you have a center, center right in the Arizona legislature that will listen. I was actually going to ask yeah. you to talk a little bit about that because you ran with public education, 
at the center of your campaign. You've made a point of trying to appeal to purple voters, yeah. moderate Republican voters. Give us a sense of how you talked about these issues with an eye towards expanding that coalition. Yeah, thank you. Um, first off, I live in a Republican district. I should not be a Democrat in office. Um, and what I have discovered, when you're saying that the legislature wants facts, there are very few, unfortunately, right now at this moment in time on the Republican side who actually want facts, which to me is incredibly tragic because that does not represent the doors that I knock on, the thousands of doors that I knock on, thousands and thousands, independents and Republicans um, they send me as a candidate almost exclusively to Republican and independent doors. Only at the very end do I start knocking on Democratic doors. Um, and what is behind the doors is not what is in office. And I'm not going to go into the weeds, but it's because of our primary system and just the way that pans out. Um, so it's really quite sad because the average Republican, I'm not dating a Republican, you guys. I mean, like <laughs> the average Republican um, is very moderate. There's the 30% that we're not going to sway no matter what. And yet I will say I take great, I had, I had a blast um, in the 2020 cycle convincing Trump voters to vote for me. I'm like that's national. We're not going to talk about Trump. Whatever you're doing on the national level, that's fine. What about local? What about right here and right now? And to get that, to get Marsh Trump voters, I'm like all in on that. Um, but it is, it's, it's a lot of questions and it's a lot of listening and it's a lot of finding the common ground. And, and then it's more questions, right? When they're coming up with something troubling to take them, to make them go the next step. You know, I mean, this indoctrination thing that uh, is a myth that teachers are indoctrinating. I mean, if I could indoctrinate my students, for God's sake, their stuff would be turned in on time. <laughs> and I mean, they wouldn't, there would be nobody failing. I mean, if I could indeed indoctrinate my students, I wouldn't be using it for anything other than getting their work in on time. So to push those people like, well, where, where have you seen that? Where, you know, what do you exactly, where have you actually seen a teacher indoctrinating a student? Because quite frankly, I don't see it. And I know firsthand after 30 plus years of teaching that that's not indeed, that that's not actually possible. Like Harvey, Harvey Milk once famously said, and it's been checked, that if you could indoctrinate, if teachers could indoctrinate students, parts of this country would be filled with nuns. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. Nuns, not nuns. Yeah, nuns. So I want to go back to Reggie. So one of the things that one of the points that Brant made yesterday that I thought was so eloquent was that you know it isn't just that we have this problem with the DeSantis or Moms for Liberty. It's that you know we forgot we forgot how to do it. We forgot how to do participatory democracy. We forgot how to talk to people with whom we don't agree. And I feel like one of the, you've been making a case for people to get more involved in all kinds of ways. So I'm giving you the opportunity to make that case right now. Yeah. So one of the, one of the notes that I took was to, you know, to, to join the school board, but go to the school board meetings, write op-eds, and don't be afraid, but go to going back to your earlier question, how do you make it not political is when every time that, so I'll, I'll let you in on a, on a secret. The university in general was not happy that I was on national TV talking about it because um, it, it could, they didn't know what I was going to say. They didn't know how it was going to be received uh, by DeSantis. But every, all three times that I was on MSNBC, I had a text from the, the director of communication saying, wow, you did a great job. You knocked that out of the park. And my whole concept was I'm not debating the, the governor. I'm debating the things from a curriculum perspective that, that was raised. And so I think that as scholars, we can do that. 
as opposed to making this a cultural war, let's talk about what it is that we are doing. What let's talk about let's talk about the curriculum. Let's talk about how perhaps we can make the curriculum better. Let's talk about our teachers. So uh, in in my notes, I was I was thinking that you know I have a individual from the Tallahassee Democrat that reaches out virtually once a month that asks to us to write op eds, and we're very um, uh, untrusting of him because. We said, well, you always write bad stories about Florida and m University. You always uh, uh, paint us in a negative light, so we're not going to talk to you. But after this particular this conversation, I know I have a responsibility to send him stuff, and not just him, but individuals, uh, uh, news organs throughout the nation, op eds, because I think it's important that the uh, the population is to know who we are as historians, that historians are actually not in this ivory tower and, and indoctrinating individuals, right? We are individuals that you would see at the grocery store. You know, one of my neighbors was surprised and that lives right next door to me, uh, who's a Republican. Um, and they see me walk my dog every day. They didn't know anything. They didn't know what I did for a living, right? And then they said, oh, Reggie, we saw you on the news. I'm so proud that you were there. I didn't. I don't agree with everything that the governor says, right? And so, but just by you putting a face on the historian and being a historian, it changes the perception of what it is that we are doing. But I think we do have to get out of the ivory tower. We have to... Um, humanize the field in some ways. Julian, I want to go back to you because you hinted at the very beginning that in this work that you're doing with the Network for Public Education, that NPE is going to be releasing a, re a resolution on the ways that that uh, folks in K-12 and higher ed can work together. NPE will be having its national meeting at the end of next month. You and I will be both be there. Tell us about that. Yes, um, yes, I will. Two quick things. One, when I was a younger man, I tried dating a Republican. That didn't work out well. And and two, and two, um, I was thinking about you when you asked about the um the 24 pages of the standards. Well, you know, when I started to hear about this benefits of slavery thing, that's when I went and, and dug in. And so I I was talking about it on Twitter, and all these people from Florida were like, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that. So I just went to the standards and I took a screen capture and said, here's what it looks like. Here's the whole document. Here's what page it's on. Oh, but I can't seem to find, I'm like, look, I can't take you to the water, right? I mean, but I think it's incumbent upon us. And what I love about this crowd is that you, you are closing this down. Like you are here. And so if we're going to ask you questions about, did you read this or did you read that? I know you're all going to raise your hands because you are the ones that are sticking it out, right? And But that's part of what we have to be able to do. We have to be prepared to go into these conversations. We have to be fully prepared so that when someone says, oh, well, scholars designed these standards, or it doesn't say that in the standards, you can just, you're fact-based and just say on page six, it does. And this is who intervened in that whole process and the crazy that came out of that intervention, right? So we, we have to be prepared. Okay, so back to what the original question was, sorry. Excuse me. Um, so come down out of the ivory tower. You made the comment that we need more administrators here. I, I, I may be the only provost here and it was a lot to trek down here, but it was so important for me to be here because if you think back to the civil rights movement, it was the coalitions of people from different stakeholder groups that really made the civil rights movement go. The clergy, the academics, the unions, the grassroots. And so that's what MPE represents. And that's where I met Senator D'Alessandro is at MPE. And so this is one of those few conferences where legislators come, the unions come, you know, Randy's going to be there, Becky's going to be there from the AFT, NEA, um, where you'll see scholars there. This is the only place where folks from all aspects, all the parents, all the stakeholder groups will be there planning strategy and having discussions about what's coming next for that next year for public education. And for the first time, we're actually going to stretch ourselves. And this is going to be a conversation about K-12 and higher ed, harkening back to my earlier conversations. Now, I don't want to give it away because I don't want the folks out there that may not uh, agree with this approach um, to know what we're up to. But we're thinking about how we're, we're planning a resolution that where K-12 and higher education will link arms around these issues. Because a lot of times the historians are doing 
uh, uh, you know, um, a, a resolution here and then you have other groups here, but this is really a group coalescing all the stakeholder groups across K-12 and higher end. That means that the resolution has to be crafted a certain way, has to include privatization and, and other things, but I think we're going to have a resolution that folks can sign on to in higher ed and K-12 that shows a united front. That that's terrific. So I know um, I want to make sure that people have plenty of time to ask questions, but I want to give everybody the chance to just weigh in one more time. Prior, our the last session that we heard was just amazing, and there were two lines that really stood out to me. And um, uh, one was um, Changa Bay saying that you know we're not dealing with the brain trust here, and I just wanted to repeat that because I loved it so much. But the the other was um, um, Cassie Owens Moore encouraging us that you know, no matter how small the space is that, that we're occupying, that we try to explode it in some way. And so I want you, I want us to go down the line and I want you to talk about either something you're doing in your own work or give us some advice about some sort of concrete thing we can do to further the, the resistance. And uh, Paul, let's start with you. There's so many things going on now. And Oh, I would love to like just go on down the line and ask everyone the, the, this question. But you know, I'll just mention a couple of things. Jennifer. So one of the things that I've been doing, really, especially in the past few years, and in the Black Lives Matter movement is a global movement, and it's been alluded to several times. The Black Lives Matter movement has really changed everything, not just in this country. So my former students who live in Germany, Brazil, um, South America, you know, different parts of the world, tell me basically the same thing, that the Black Lives Matter movement has opened up critical democratic spaces in their respective countries. And what it has done here is just remarkable. So my work as a Latinx historian, that, that side of me, my the number of speaking gigs that I have for Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month has quadrupled since Black Lives Matter. The, the, the resurgence in 2020. Now I'm speaking increasingly to global corporations. So I've done keynotes for Deutsche Bank, uh, Bank of America, uh, Wednesday, Wells Fargo. Yes, that Wells Fargo. And, and this reminds me of what Governor DeSantis and Trump say about world capitalism. And this is what I mean by these spaces. See, corporations in some ways now are more radical than universities. And the reason is, is that their employees are demanding a new kind of education. And it was interesting. I remember the first call I got from a global bank. And they said, we want you to, you know, we will sign African American Latinx history of the United States as a common read in our corporation. And I've said, um, oh, did you know that there's a chapter in there called the government of American banks? And they said, yeah, we know that. And we want to do something different. We, we, we. We know what you read about the National City Bank in Central America in the early 20th century, but all employees, they all have affinity groups, veterans group, uh, groups, LGBT groups, trans groups, Latinx groups, black groups. And so it's interesting, Jennifer, when I, again, when I, when I work with the corporate sector now, uh, it's almost like I'm in this like radical kind of space that I'm not even in the university world. Uh, and it gets back to something, Jim, that you said earlier, that corporations, and I know this for a fact, corporations are looking for gender studies majors. They're looking for black studies majors. And they're beginning to, my, my concern as a first generation uh, college student who cares deeply about the vocational part of higher ed, is that Florida is going to begin to look bad for some of these employers. But the last thing I'll say about what we're doing now is, if you look at, the, at our campuses throughout the entire state, the university and college campuses, we are, there's a lot of amazing things going on. So at UAP, just in the past year, the Center for Latin American Studies, we, made, we have a global conference every year. The theme of it this past year was anti-racism in Latin America. I'll bet you that made Governor DeSantis tickled, right? Uh, African American Studies, my colleague Dave Cannon, who spoke earlier, we hosted a national African American Studies conference. The oral history program that I direct, our year-long public program series was challenging racism. 
So the reason we do these things is not because we're left or right or right. And I've never found left or right distinctions even meaningful in higher education. The reason we do these things is the reason why all of us are sitting here on Saturday late afternoon. Our students. This is the work our students want us to do. This is why we're here, whether we're K-12 educators or faculty. It's our students. That's where they're at. Jim, would you like to go next? Okay, quickly. Uh, so one thing that we are trying to uh, find some money to do, um, we have a couple of possible foundations, uh, is we want to um, do online workshops and annual meeting workshops for teachers in states where these laws have been passed uh, so that we can help teachers um, work on lesson plans, curricula that are historically accurate, uh, but they don't need to worry about losing their job. Uh, if you go to, I'm going to do a pitch here. Uh, if you go to, if you just Google American Historical Association teaching history with integrity, uh, you'll find everything that we're doing. The other thing that we want to do and that relate, that's a part of that, we've actually already done one, and I would encourage everybody to look at it because of something that was said uh, yesterday. Uh, we want to do short videos, 30 seconds to two minute videos uh, for teachers to use in their classrooms uh, that deal with some of these kinds of issues. And there's a great example on our website. There's a two minute video of a high school teacher who grew up in Germany and her uh, grandparents, uh, were either complicit, complacent, it's collaborative, it's kind of hard to tell with the Nazis, she's very careful. Uh, but she talks about how, how her grandparents did this, how from age 10 in Germany, she learned what the country had done. She doesn't say the Nazis, she says she refers to it as my country. And then she says at the end, and I'm going to spoil her here, but still see it, she says it better than I do. She says, Learning all this did not make me love my country any less. Learning all this did not make me love my grandparents any less. It makes me love them more. And these are the kinds of things that we want to try to do in order to try to address this issue of fear of children hate being taught to hate America. Uh, what we want teachers to be able to do is to be able to explain to parents we are not uh, suggesting to your kids that they are responsible for what their grandparents did. They are not responsible for what you're doing. They are responsible for shaping the future. And if they're going to do it responsibly, they damn well better learn some good history. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to try. We want to try to do uh, in order to actually be helpful. Um, because it's all about the students, right? And so it's all about providing teachers with the tools they need to reach students in the way it's easiest to reach students right now. That's great. Reggie, that really reminds me of your words that we started off with, do not cower. And I want you to just I want you to, to just really channel that for us and tell us, you know, what it means and what we should be thinking about when we find ourselves in situations where every bit of a state policy apparatus is is intent on making us feel like we should cower. Well, just at lunch, um, we, uh, Jim and Dave and I were, we were discussing and I was talked about, you know, during this process, everyone, a lot of individuals has, have asked, you know, how is it, how is it going at family? Matter of fact, individual from the Chronicle of Higher Education reached out and AP and, uh, have, uh, Associated Press reached out to say, you know, you know, is it hard for you to teach? Actually, it's not. Nobody cares what I'm teaching in my classroom. Uh, to use Dave's word, I'm I'm teaching behind the veil. And I thought about the Booker T. Washington statue at Tuskegee. I am literally teaching behind a veil, but but because of that, I do have a larger responsibility to the discipline. So I want to go back to your earlier question: Is oh, what 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 are some of our takeaways? I have two. One, don't just go to the school board or don't go to don't just go to the session. It's about the students. Take them with you. Right. May have your students, have your classes go attend these events. Not don't just send them for extra credit. 
have them go with you and then come back and discuss this in class and make it practical, right? Make it practical and, and encourage them to perhaps even think about <laughs> running for office, writing op-eds and things of that nature. And the second piece um, that I've been thinking about for several years, and it's really real right now, is that I hope that if you're not a member of any of these organizations, that before you leave today, that you join the AHA, that you join the OAH, that you join ASALA, because these organizations will connect you to resources that individually you don't have access to, right? We're not on an island, right? These organizations really have been there to help ensure, particularly the ones that I just named, that historians have those level of resources, that you have a connection. I, and I tell stories all the time about how the AHA in a lot of ways helped save the, 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 the major of history at Florida and m University simply because we received, uh, AHA came down and did a mini conference on our campus and our provosts and, and associate provosts are like, wow, we are actually doing something, right? And so as school teachers, K-12, please join these organizations because you know there, there's not only power in number, there's also power in resources because we need you, you need us, we are all in this together. So please, before you leave, if you're not a member of these organizations, now is not, the, it is the time. Now is not the time to be isolated. Now is the time to be unified. And the, the organizations are already created. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Acronym alert. Asala Association for the Study of African American Life and History. <laughs> Harvard B. Woodson. Uh, Christine, you have given us a number of suggestions about how we should march boldly forward. Thanks to your encouragement, most of the classroom teachers in the audience are now going to run for office. <laughs> what else would you send us away with? Uh, I would send away with, uh, and this came from somebody, the session's all blur, but mm -hmm. definitely um, not accepting the far right framing um, and to even maybe not even use the word Republican because it isn't. It is a far right faction. It's not Republican, but it certainly is far right. So in Arizona, that means we have to flip the legislature and put the Democrats in control. But, you know, I mean, we don't have to use that framing. I mean, uh, in Arizona, this whole notion of vouchers and privatization is really taken over um, and to flip the frame that it is not about school choice. It's about a private school's choice of who they're going to accept. It's still the parent's choice. So when my colleagues across the aisle are throwing that around, I'm like, all these public school parents also made a choice. That is their choice. Um, you know, and, and to just flip that, to flip as many words as possible into appropriate framing um, and to, while we don't want to cower, I totally agree, we also do not want to escalate, right? We don't want to get into shouting matches because you're never going to win anyone over. And if you're getting into shouting match with the 30% like super right wing, then you're a fool because you're not going to convince them anyway. But it's everybody else that we can pull over, but it isn't going to happen if we ourselves are escalating instead of de-escalating. And I think that there's a pretty broad path between not cowering and also not escalating. That's so well put. And Julian, I want to give you the last word because when you and I were talking, you mentioned that you were really moved by the discussion of empathy yeah. on the previous panel. And empathy yeah. is a teaching strategy. And that seems in many ways like it overlaps with what Christine was just saying. Yeah. The school choice is schools choose that right you can choose harvard but harvard also has to choose you so um so i just want to say that before we get rolling here you know um you know there's that talk about discomfort um education is that place where that discomfort should happen that should happen on our campus in kalamazoo 
right? There was a lot of things when I went to university at Michigan that made me feel uncomfortable because I had not learned anything about that in, in K-12, had not had that opportunity, right? But out of that, out of that discomfort comes empathy. Now the empathy, I believe, comes action. And really what we're talking about here is our democracy. Our democracy is at stake. There are people that are willing to sacrifice our democracy for, the, for their ideals, for their right-wing ideals. Um, we have to protect our democracy. Sometimes you lose and you come back the next time and you, and you try to win. You don't try to burn it all down and siege the institutions. That's what it takes in a democracy. But I'm gonna tell you, I have a lot of hope because many of you interact with the students of the modern day, whether in K-12 classrooms, whether they're in higher education, and these students light my fire. They light my fire, they're a totally different generation. They wanna leave a legacy. They wanna make an impact. They care about the planet. It's incredible how, um, how our, our society is producing such an incredible generation. So I have a lot of hope. And I, I think that's why education is under assault because our society is creating these amazing, amazing young people. So I have a lot of hope for our democracy. What, what a great note to end on. So we do have some time um, left to take questions. Daisha is standing by ready to assist and the panelists have all assured me that you can ask them anything. <laughs> So that was fantastic. I think we all really needed that great shot in the arm coming from five different directions with great stuff. One thing that didn't come up that I would love for people to hear more about because it's something that people can do with others. You don't have to be in a classroom. You don't have to be a teacher. And that is, um, Christine, the the group that developed in Arizona, Save Our, Our Schools Arizona, which I understand just had a gala of over 400 people. Could you tell a little bit about how that group came together, the work that they've done in Arizona, how it's built and and if you think that's a model that's replicable elsewhere yeah it's a grassroots group uh it started oh i want to say maybe 2016 ish but it started as a push back to this constant voucher expansion that we have seen in Arizona, um, ultimately culminating in flinging open the doors completely to where we now have universal vouchers. Um, and they came together to get on the petition, uh, get signatures and get on the ballot so that uh, people could weigh in on voucher expansion. Um, and the voters overwhelmingly voted it down, um, voted down voucher expansion, but then the legislature came in and did it anyway, because. Back to what I'm saying that we are, it is in Arizona, maybe it's across the country, I don't know. There are only, uh, there's only really two, really one, but I'm being generous, two senators that I would consider Republican. The rest are absolutely right wing. But again, that is a symptom of our primary system. Um, and so they, the the save our schools came together and they still do a whole lot of activism um they they get people to write to their legislators they have bill watches like where people go through and pick through all of the bills and send that out to folks so people understand uh exactly what bills are getting voted on um and they have just positioned themselves rightfully so as just absolute education experts in Arizona. And it's a pretty widespread, um, pretty widespread, pretty powerful group. Uh, I'm David Raban from the University of Texas. Uh, one theme that's really come through to me over these past few days is the importance of politics. And I feel I myself and probably lots of us here have been so focused understandably about what's been going on within universities that politics has been neglected. And these days, politics is particularly important. So Christine, my question is for you. I'm wondering whether uh, the organized Democratic Party nationally is looking for people like you to run. 
And whether you yourself are involved in trying to find and then convince people like you to run for elective office. Yes, the Democratic Party um, in our, across the nation is pretty active, and they are going through and looking. Um, in an, on in Arizona, I serve on the board of the what's called the ADLCC, the Arizona Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, and we go through and find candidates to run, especially in the only five, there's only five swing districts. So those, we make sure we have absolutely really strong candidates, but we are recruiting to run people in every race, even if it's deep red, um, there's a lot of power. I mean, that is my dream. I'm going to move one day when I, um, when Arizona is securely like, in democratic hands again i hate to do this because i'm so moderate and i'm not this is but it, that is just our reality uh, we have proven i have proven and so have the democrats our ability to place policy over politics that has not happened on the other side so with that said um i would love to run in a deep red district with no chance of winning <laughs> just to raise the dialogue i mean even those people play a crucial role um, in Biden's election, one of the deepest red districts in our state, they had the highest democratic turnout. I mean, I'm convinced that they are the ones that actually elected Biden like to Arizona. Um, and yet that legislative candidate, he never had a prayer, but he was out there and raising the dialogue and raising the discussion. And, you know, it, now I've lost the thread of the conversation. But yes, there are people absolutely on both the national and state level who are very honed in on this. I want to emphasize too. Oh, run for something. Look it up. Right. I, I, I want to take issue with you slightly. Because you framed it as a national, you know, what's being done at the national level. You teach at University of Texas, Austin. And one of the things that we have found is that academics, I think especially humanists, always think at the national level. Your answer was a local level answer to a national level question. We are trying to get our members to think about themselves as members of local communities. We have a staff member who has testified before the Texas Board of Education. She has testified to a committee of the Texas State Legislature. What I would like to see UT Austin faculty members do is the same thing. You're, they're doing it, that's good. The, how many, how many fac, college faculty members are there here? How many of you thought of running for your local school board? You're all educators. You're all educators. You are all qualified to be members of your local school board. I think this, when you talk about what can we do, one of the things that, quite frankly, academics have to do is think of ourselves much more as politically as members of local communities, whether that means writing our op-eds not for the New York Times, but for our local newspaper, appearing on local radio stations, operating at the level you were just talking about. And I think this is a real problem for academics. So my career started at UT Austin. My, my career started at UT Austin. So as you know, you could just walk right up, right down the street, over to the Capitol, down to the basement and work on legislation. I did, right. Oh, it's at the night. It's a little hot. Yeah, that's, that's true. You gotta, you, gotta t you gotta drive your car the two blocks and then, then walk downstairs. Um, so yeah, that work happens. Um, you know, Angela Valenzuela is one person that I can that, that I can think of that does that work. Um, she mentored me in that work early on in my career. Um, so so absolutely, I, I, you know, I knock doors. Um, but also, um, I think we we also have to think about the candidates that go through primaries, regardless of the party. So if you ask candidates, what are your top issues and you don't prompt them, education is one of the top five. Now, if you prompt them with the whole set of things, it'll be top 10. But part of the thing is, is that uh, even within the Democratic Party, 
there are folks that have Betsy DeVosian type ideas. Um, perhaps maybe even the speaker, uh, the um, minority leader in the house. Anyways, so the challenge we have is having uh, accountability for candidates, regardless of their party, around public education and access to education and democratic control of education. And so part of that is giving to candidates who support that, even if it's in small increments, volunteering for those candidates, block walking, making phone calls for them, volunteering for committees when they when they have education committees. There's a whole set of grassroots things that, that I've done and that my colleagues do for candidates. And, and, you know, when I was at Texas, if Republicans called me and asked me to come down to the Capitol to talk to them about something, I absolutely would do that. I, I did not, um, you know, discern between Republican or, or Democrat. So there are a whole set of grassroots things, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, that you can do to support public education and democratic control of higher ed and K-12. My turn? Okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to really second what was just said. I mean, I think the reason the extreme right has come so far uh, with all of these issues is their willingness to get in a local trench and stay there. Um, and that's what, uh, you know, not all of us have been have been willing to do. But teachers are in those trenches, of course. We can't be anywhere else. I'm a, a high school history and government teacher in Miami. And I... Um, I want to also just um, repeat something that was said early on, which is how important it is to know and read the the standards and the statutes. Um, and and for those of us who raised our hand at that question, um, you know, we know that the those uh, standards and statutes are pretty inc incoherent at times. I mean, they're often morally incoherent, but also just semantically, like they contradict <laughs> themselves. Um, some of them have some fuzzy interesting grammar uh, going on. But for example, Florida law requires me to teach my students that US history is uh, not constructed, but uh, factual and testable. I'm not really sure. I think what they mean is that that historical knowledge is should be evidence based, which I agree with. But I don't know what they mean about history itself being testable, like if we're in the control group or or what. Um, but it's uh, it can be really hard to parse, uh, is what I'm saying. And and a lot of that's on purpose, as we know. This is weaponized ambiguity. And in the face of that, I mean, we've talked about so many important strategies. Um, you know, what do teachers need? We need uh, we need these conversations. Um, we need lawyers, probably. Um, we need people that we can call. Um, but, you know, we really need this professional solidarity that I think this conference has has gone a long way to, to create. And, um, I mean, it strikes me that what few spaces exist for connections between K through 12 and, and higher ed, what few spaces are already there? They're very top down. Um, and I think Julian, you have made some of the, the clearest statements so far just in the last hour on the need to create egalitarian spaces for K through 12 and university level educators to, to talk to each other and, and have conversations like this. Um, because I think that, you know, we need your help. We need help. Um, we need advice. We need information. But we really, really need community. Um, and and there's a lot that that y'all can do to, to help foster that. So can I um, maybe just ask you, Julian, like, what do you think? Um, how do we how do we take this spirit uh, and make it into to uh, lasting institutions? Well, so for the last decade, um, Network for Public Education has been doing just that. Um, so I would recommend you come to DC and you meet stakeholders from across the United States, legislators, uh, the union leaders, everybody will be there if you're able. Um, and if you need a partner or something, we can figure that out. I can probably get you a free registration. You just let me know. Uh, we, we can hook all that up. Um, so that's where I would start, because then you'll become a part of a 300,000 strong um, listserv of folks that are working on this when we need to respond to particular things. So if we get something out of Arizona or we get something out of Minnesota, then what we do is we send in emails uh, to folks in that area to let them know this legislation is pending, et cetera. So I, I think that's one way. I think another way, quite frankly, is get involved with civil rights. There's a lot of civil rights organizations um, out there. I've been involved with the NAACP for quite some time. And the, what's, civil, what's, you know, I had, I was the education chair in California. And I, I remember the president of NAACP said to me, 
because I, I asked her, I said, you know, um, what was it like living through the civil civil rights movement? Um, and she told me, well, Julian, what you're doing right now is what you would have been doing then. And so that's the question you have to ask yourself is what are you doing now? Right. And so I, I think civil rights is a big part of that. There, there are a variety of civil rights organizations uh, uh, that that advocate on behalf of various historically marginalized communities. So those would be two sort of solid recommendations. Uh, actually, a third one. And, and this, you're probably already doing this. Get involved with your union, whether it's AFT, NEA. Um, those folks um, are working in a democratic fashion to make a difference. And there's a reason why there's a siege on teachers and their associations is because they're so incredibly effective at advocating for children. Let me say that again, advocating for children and their families and their communities. And so that would be the third thing. So civil rights, your union, uh, and NPE. You know, just to dovetail what uh, Julian was saying, more and more people are learning this kind of local community organizing through their local labor council. So we're the ones that stuff the envelopes we make the calls during elections. We, you know, we work with moderate folks. Or we try to work with moderate folks across the aisle. One of the things, you know, I'm working on a book now called "A Social Movement History of the United States," and one of the things that strikes me that's been happening in this country in the last 30, 40 years is the impoverishment of the idea of the citizen and the sh the radical shrinking. I know David is shaking his head because, and if you look at the work of people like Sheldon Rowland and others, what they pointed out to us is that. Traditionally, the idea of the citizen had to do with community. It had to do with our relationship, the relationship between the people on the stage and in the audience. The shrinkage has occurred because now we're encouraged to see the citizen as simply as a consumer and vis-a-vis -vis a relationship to the state. Okay, So we've got to recapture that idea of mutuality, of solidarity. And the, those kind of those ideas that are really percolated this whole weekend have, have given us, I think, a pathway in how to do that. I um there was a period of time I think it's waned a little bit when it was sort of a postmodern thing about uh, decentering citizenship and saying it wasn't very important. Those of us who work in African American history knew that was wrong, and I think that the model of what you're talking about is also read some of the material on emancipation and on the Great Migration. The Great Migration uh, was cast by people who wrote about it somewhat similar to things you see today. Well, all they wanted was jobs. They came north because they could get jobs and more money. But actually, when you read the primary sources, you find out that it was about citizenship, local citizenship, as well as national, national citizenship, because there were thousands of, mig of, of migrants from the South who wrote letters, short letters, two sentences, three sentences, about why they were leaving and what they were leaving for. And it was about citizenship, if you read it, carefully. So I think this is, again, you asked me at the beginning to put this in historical context. I think in historical context, this is not new. What an inspiring call to action and a reminder that I have so much more work to do. So join me in thanking Jennifer, our wonderful moderator, and this incredibly inspiring. Yeah.